Hello everybody, welcome to a new episode of The Dissenter. I'm your host, Ricardo Lopes, and today I'm joined by Dr. Pascal Boyer. He is the Henri Luce Professor of Individual and Collective Memory in the Departments of Psychology and Anthropology at Washington University in St. Louis. He was a Guggenheim Fellow and a visiting professor at the University of California, Santa Barbara, and the University of Lyon in France. He is also the author of books like Religion Explained, Memory, Mind and Culture, and the most recent one, Minds Make Societies. So, Pascal, thank you a lot for taking the time to come on the show. It's a real pleasure to finally have you on. So. Well, it's, it's a great pleasure, and it's an honor to join a line of uh, great speakers who've been on your on your show. So, thank oh, you. Oh, it, it's it's completely my hon my honor <laughs> because you've been. Uh, I have to tell you this: you've been an intellectual hero of mine. So <laughs> I really love your work. Okay. So <laughs> ju just to put that out there. So, uh, okay, so. Uh, we're going to focus mostly on your last book, Minds Make Societies, which, by the way, is a fascinating book. Uh, and I I've been talking with a lot of different people on the show, particularly evolutionary uh -huh. psychologists and some anthropologists. And this is, um, I mean, the approach that you have on the book is very interesting in the sense that uh, you try to explain, or at least you try to explain certain parts of human societies, starting with an evolutionary perspective. That is, you try, you try to explain how we developed mm -hmm. certain aspects of our behavior, the functioning of our societies, even perhaps some uh, social institutions, by first understanding how our minds work. So could you first maybe give us a brief overview of, of, of what is your basic argument there? I mean, where do you start off with? Well, the, the, the book starts off with the idea that um, uh, there is a kind of a new kind of social science that is emerging. Um, that is done by lots of people in different places, in different uh, ways, in different disciplines. And the book was uh, sort of uh, trying to, to put together a catalog of all this brilliant research done by lots of people. Um, and, you know, uh, very little of, uh, of that is actually mine. Um, uh, but also to synthesize it and show that um, the, 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 there are two great things about this new kinds of new kind of social science. Um, one is that it asks and tries to answer uh, questions that matter. Um, and too too much of the social sciences is uh, sort of preoccupied by academic fetishes or things that do not really matter to anyone outside academia. Uh, but we should be uh, able to answer questions like, you know, um, are the fa are families the same in uh, all human societies? Do they have the, the same structure? Um, are gender roles very similar? And why um, do uh, religions develop um, because of uh, human propensities or are they infinitely diverse? Uh, do we have a sense of morality and justice that is uh, fundamentally human and uh, that is the same in different cultures or not. Um, so all these interesting questions, um, I think, can be answered in a much better way if we do something uh, that a lot of social science has been trying very hard not to do uh, in the last century, <laughs> uh, which is to integrate everything we know about human um, evolution uh, about our biological evolution, our genetic evolution, um, about the um, the way our brains work, also the way um, um, collectives work in the sense that uh, microeconomics shows us how uh, interaction works. Uh, all these things should be put together in this package that tries to answer these questions, you know, um, these important questions. So the book goes through uh, six of these questions and uh, just tries to say for each of them, you know, there is 
uh, a set of interesting sort of paths or uh, towards answers uh, from this uh, new kind of social science. And, um, and then I gave the details of what I think is the, 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 the best of our knowledge um, in these different kinds of uh, t topics. Mm -hmm. uh, yes, and it's very interesting. And I guess that when you were referring just now to uh, certain parts of academia that don't really interest people outside of it, I guess that some of them also don't interest that much serious scientists <laughs> referring well, to, yes. for example, things like postmodernism, right? Yeah, yeah, sure. Uh, and, and it's several, and it's many, several forms uh, that plagued basically social science uh, through the over the last several decades and things like that. So, and I guess that one very important aspect here to consider is that in your book you start from a position that is against blank slavism, right? I, I mean, right. you you, you yeah. don't start fr uh, from the assumption that we are born with completely empty minds, let's say, but uh, through the process of evolution by natural selection, our minds not only evolved in certain ways to be able to uh, detect uh, or to mm -hmm. gather certain types of information, to process it in certain ways, certain specific ways, and then to uh, give us some uh, specific out outputs as well, uh, mainly in terms of mm -hmm. behavior, uh, but also that the environment is not something that is completely disconnected from our biology, because we, right. when we are born, we are already expecting to deal with certain types of evolutionarily relevant problems. Is that correct? Yeah, that's right. And the, the, the main thing is that, you know, we have to get rid of those um, ways of thinking that, that, that rely on oppositions that not really matter, like the one between nature and culture, which I think is uh, one of the plagues of, um, of social sciences. Because it stops thinking, it 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 it's um, it's um, it's an obstacle to 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 proper sort of uh, explanations of human behavior. But the one about genes and environment is very important for me because I think these questions are are really seen um, in a way um, in 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 traditional sort of approaches to to society in a way that's very misleading. So, um, for example, we think that. Uh, genes are essentially fixed. Um, that is, uh, they they only prov prov uh, produce uh, traits or behaviors that are totally fixed. Like you know, uh, we have a stomach and that's it. You know, if we're human, that's the way we are. Uh, so we think of genes that way. Uh, that is as producing uh, something that is absolutely not sensitive to external conditions. And we think of environments um, as uh, being something that's just out there and is not very complicated to explain. So both are, are false, and we know that. We know, for example, that uh, the, the, the whole point about uh, genetic expression is that it's highly sensitive to external conditions, and that uh, genes are um, expressed, repressed, depending on the effect of other genes, but also on um, external sort of information. And for the environment side of this uh, uh, this dispute, it's 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 uh, or this contrast, it's also clear in the sense that um, um, at the beginning of the book, I tried to emphasize the fact that there is no such thing as the environment. There are environments depending on what um, uh, what capacities the the organism has to identify it. So, for example, I take the, 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 the example of um, the degree of salinity, how much salt there is in water. Mm -hmm. um, if you're a human swimmer or a duck, you couldn't care less. Okay, you're just swimming around and doing your stuff. Um, if you're a eel or a salmon, that is very important information because it tells you how to get from the sea to, uh, to a river. Now, um, so in that sense, salinity is not part of 
of the environment for a duck, a dog, or a uh, human being, but it is part of the environment for an eel or salmon. So uh, the idea is that you only have something that is part of the environment if you have the systems that detect it. So ultraviolet light is not part of our environment, uh, us humans, because we do not detect it. It is for bees and many uh, and some other organisms. Um, but in the same way, um, for example, the um, um, the extent to which your community uh, has cooperation or power or conflict with others, that's an environment for us human beings only because we have the mental systems to detect these things. So, you know, you can put some organism have a clever uh, from another species and they will not detect power relations in a human community because we have the, the, the system to detect that, they don't. On the other hand, they might detect things that we do not uh, detect. So that's um, uh, a really important um, sort of uh, point and it goes through all the questions, you know, about the family, religions, politics and, and so on and so forth, where you say, well, what are the, 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 the evolved systems that we have that allow us to detect uh, particular features of the environment as relevant to our behavior? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yes, that's very interesting and I really get uh, very easily bothered by the ideas that some people have, particularly the, mm -hmm. bl uh, the blank slate approach, because sometimes when I'm discussing with people that have that kind of approach, I just ask them, so uh, if, by, uh, if a particular being is exposed to a certain particular kind of information uh, and that's what influences its behavior. Why is it the case that, for example, you have a dog in your house and you talk with him all the time <laughs> and, he, and he doesn't learn how to it speak, doesn't. right? <laughs> <laughs> doesn't I talk mean, back. It, it's, it, gets, it, it gets really problematic for people who hold those kinds of positions because how it's, would you yeah. explain that if you don't take sure. into account the innate biological predispositions of each particular animal or whatever, right? Yeah, but it's true that uh, um, uh, lots of people would say that, of course, blank slatism is absurd and, and you know, uh, there has to be some sort of degree of uh, preparation for uh, being uh, human. Um, however, when you get to specifics and, to, and you say, well, then uh, perhaps a disposition to form hierarchies and have leaders and followers in human groups that cooperate on some task, that may be one of those things that we're prepared to do. At that point, people immediately say, oh, no, 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 no. So the idea is that, well, even people who say, well, blank slatism would be absurd, would at the same time be very uh, reluctant to agree to anything that seems to be, you know, uh, at first sight, a very good example of uh, a human adaptation. But, you know, thinking of uh, uh, dogs that do not talk back, um, the, um, David Premack, who was uh, a great sort of researcher in primate cognition and chimpanzees, uh, said that some some um, uh, specialists who'd had young chimps living with them in the family for years uh, had noticed things that were even more striking. Of course, the chimpanzee never never talked back. Um, the chim chimp was treated as sort of uh, something between a pet and a, and a child. But, uh, for example, um, Premack said that he and his uh, children would uh, play basketball, you know, the way it's done in American uh, uh, backyards. You have one hoop and you shoot hoops and stuff like that. They did that millions of times maybe in front of the chimp who watched that. And the chimp never, ever tried to slow the, throw the ball in the hoop. Never. Uh, and why is that? Well, because that behavior for a chimp's brain just doesn't mean it anything. It's just visual noise. Mm -hmm. So it's a bit like, you know, ultraviolet lights for, for, for our eyes. We just don't see it. So the chimp just didn't see that as a behavior because it didn't seem to have any result that was um, comprehensible. So, yeah, I mean, we, we have to have preparation. And I think uh, the more... Um, 
what's curing us of this weird idea that we are not prepared for s specific environments and 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 uh, information is the development of uh, studies in infant cognition that show that really very early you find um, all sorts of uh, ways of attending to particular aspects of the world uh, that are different. Another way we can see it is that uh, there are, unfortunately, human beings who do not have those uh, capacities. So uh, you can see from infancy that some children um, are not um, attending to cues like gaze and pointing and things like that, and they will become autistic patients. Uh, so now we know we can predict from their behavior at 10 months or 12 months that what will happen. Uh, so that shows that being uh, attentive to people's gaze and uh, and uh, what it says about, about the world and about people's minds uh, is something that a 10 months old infant is prepared to attend to. And if their brain is not, uh, you know, structured right by their genes, they do not have that capacity. So they can attend to lots of things, but not to that one. Mm -hmm. So we have this sort of innate cognition, right? And uh, I've had on the show people like David Sigiri, and we talked about what some people call core knowledge, including folk physics, folk biology, folk psychology. Uh, later in this interview, we'll, we will probably also talk about folk economics and folk mm. sociology. But I, I would like to ask you, um, in what ways does this innate cognition or innate knowledge uh, express itself? I, I mean, what is it really about? Is it uh, in the for, uh, does it appear in the form of intuitions that people have? Is is it uh, to any extent uh, conscious or not? Oh. Because because, because th that's a very hard sure. thing to understand. I mean, people come, uh, people are sort of born with these innate tendencies to process certain types of information, like pr for example, social information yeah. or biological information no, yeah. in certain ways. But uh, but if you ask. <laughs> If you ask people about uh, these sort of core knowledge, it doesn't seem to me that uh, people that are not scientifically minded would be able to properly no. identify th that sort of knowledge, right? No, Do you I, understand I, what I mean? I see, I see what you mean, and, and, and the, the, uh, it's important to, to, to realize that most of that uh, kind of... Um, uh, a huge amount of um, uh, knowledge that we have and attend, uh, expectations we have about the environment are entirely uh, uh, tacit or unconscious. You know, we don't realize that. Uh, that's one of the, the hardest things to uh, convey, in my view, to uh, people outside um, who have no great familiarity with cognitive science. Uh, including students, it's a very hard thing to make them realize that uh, just the fact, the, 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 the way we uh, compute the shades in our environment as volumes and solid objects uh, requires millions of cycles of computation. And we're absolutely not aware, unaware of how that is done. And, and that is done. Or we, or we may be aware of is the result of these things. But you know, even um, uh, when we talk about these assumptions, uh, it's sometimes difficult to realize that they are there and they're complex, even though uh, they seem very simple, their result seems very simple to us because we have these uh, machines working very well. It's a bit like, you know, when you operate your computer, you think that, you know, What's, you know, I just asked my computer how many words there are in this file. Come on, this is so simple. Well, try to program something that does that and you'll see yeah, it takes quite a bit of computation. So uh, take a simple example. Um, if, if, I sh if I show you a, um, a, a picture of a child and there are four objects on the table or four candies, say, for example, and the child is looking at one of them like this, um, it's 
totally obvious for most human beings that the child is interested in the candy he's looking at and that this candy is the one that he prefers or she prefers. Now, again, uh, people with um, uh, some version of autism uh, spectrum disorder uh, would identify that the child is looking at this candy, would identify that a candy is something that you could desire, but they would not see the connection between looking at it uh, intently and uh, having the desire to to eat it. So uh, for them, the connection between uh, what you're attending to and your intentions is not as obvious as it is to us, which means that we have to have the system that says, hey, from the direction of gaze, you can actually identify what is going on in people's minds. Mm -hmm. um, I find this example extremely striking because, A, uh, some human beings don't do it very well. But now we found that uh, some domesticated animals, like dogs, do it actually pretty well. Uh, and the reason for that is that they evolved as uh, organisms that needed to understand what humans want. Mm -hmm. um, right. So, so we have this really interesting contrast that uh, you have to have this complex set of expectations uh, about something that may seem complete noise to all other animals and may, may seem to be very uncertain to some human beings, which is the shape of your eyes and the way the whites, you know, the shape of the different triangles of white indicates where you're gazing. Uh, plus, as I say in the book, if you want to go into the computation of these things, uh, you have lots of other expectations, like, you know, if you want to understand people's gaze, you have to understand that the gaze is a line, it's not a curve. Uh, that it's a line that stops at the first obstacle, you know, you, you do not attend to things that are hidden be behind other objects, usually. So, you have to have all these assumptions. Now, of course, no one is ever uh, looking at people's eyes and saying, okay, I will do some trigonometry <laughs> on you know, the shape of these two triangles deduct the angle of uh, 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 the line of sight, then follow the line of sight. No, people don't do that. Uh, what you, I mean, they don't do that consciously, their brain is doing it. Um, so even very young people, if you go, you know, like this, will look at what you uh, seem to be attending to. So, so yeah. These, and, and this works for lots and lots of domains. Um, it's true for language, of course, because we're not aware of the complex syntax of the language we're using, even though we use it. Um, we're not aware of um, all sorts of other things. You know, when, uh, we're often only partly aware, for example, of what makes some people uh, romantically attractive and others not. We can explain these things, but then there are lots of aspects of these uh, processes that are mysterious. And social scientists can test these things and compare, you know, the effect of this or the, of that factor, and then tell you, well, actually, your brain is sensitive to this rather than that in terms of attractiveness. And you never were I never realized that, um, you know, so sometimes, so, so for instance, uh, um, uh, well, I, I'm sure we'll, we'll we'll talk about that at some point and have more examples of this kind of stuff. But, you know, basically, yes, we, we our conscious cognition is uh, floating on top of a huge ocean of unconscious computation mm -hmm. that works very well. And that's why uh, we don't even see that it's happening. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it's interesting that uh, it seems that we have this element of our... Uh, conscious cognition, let's say, where we sort of feel the need of uh, feeling in, co in control of what is happening in our minds and how we process information. And, mm -hmm. it, it, and we even have this sense that we can control our thoughts, for example, and, and how we go from one thought to the next and things like that. And it's very interesting because people are uh, and th this manifests also uh, on other things like for example how people are worried about uh, uh, they uh, they're not understanding how 
AI processes information oh, and people yeah. say that, oh, it's basically a black box. We get a result out of the processes that are going mm -hmm. around there, but we don't understand the computational mathematical aspects yeah. of it, let's mm -hmm. say. A and then <laughs> and then sometimes I think, OK, but you also don't <sighs> understand what's going around in your mind. So Fine. are you yeah, also exactly. worried that your own brain will turn against you or something like that? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so, so uh, let me just ask you now about this then, uh, because in your book you refer to this and I've been talking a lot about uh, on my show about uh, biases and heuristics and intuitive knowledge and mm -hmm. uh, people, particularly the social psychologists, uh, have created this sort of of image of the human mind where we are completely rational, we make mistakes all the yeah. time and things like that. And uh, that's, that's, very, that's a very pessimistic and negative image <laughs> of the human mind. And, and the thing is that it could be true, but it doesn't seem to be because no, the no. the contexts and situations where people uh, came up with those conclusions are very constrained. Yeah, yeah, yes, yes. I mean, it's it's uh, it's it's something that's been uh, uh, that's been a great problem in in psychology, especially in social psychology. Um, over the last sort of 40 years that, that um, uh, people thought that really um, the, a, an interesting psychological result would be one that shows that the mind doesn't work uh, or doesn't work very well. So you have, so for example, lots of uh, research on memory is about uh, the way memory doesn't work. Um, a lot of work, but a, work, a lot of work on social psychology was trying to say, well, people are uh, really irrational. They make their decisions on the basis of uh, cues that are totally, um, uh, that are not uh, really good in terms of information. So, um, uh, for example, the, the whole school of heuristics and biases that uh, Kahneman and Tversky uh, did was to uh, try to find situations in which you can fault people and you can see that uh, their mind is not working very well. Um, however, now recently, um, you know, people have said, well, hang on, this is not quite correct. And uh, for example, the uh, biases that people like Hahnemann were talking about um, only ha happen if you if you describe information in a particular way that happens to be misleading for human uh, mind. But also, uh, we find that in um, uh, social psychology, um, uh, a lot of social psychology has been uh, devoted to trying has been yes to, to trying to to show that. Um, on the whole, uh, people are very gullible and can be convinced of anything if enough people around them uh, state uh, that thing. And, and, and it turns out that it's even in the classical studies, uh, it wasn't quite true. And um, as um, people should refer to your interview of Hugo Mercier to, to, to see how this is uh, the case, you know. And this is part of this sort of idea that what's interesting for psychologists is the fact that memory, uh, that memory or reasoning or perception do not work. Uh, but it's actually um, uh, very often the case that uh, it may not be as sexy to show that uh, things work as intended uh, but it's much more interesting because it's very difficult to explain. Um, I have an example from memory, which is that um, uh, because I used to do research on memory for uh, uh, people's attitudes and stuff, there were some studies um, showing um, uh, that when people have a political attitude, for example, mm -hmm. they remember their previous choices in terms of their present attitude. So if you've become a conservative, uh, you tend to think that you made lots of choices, like voting choices, uh, in a conservative way 20 years ago, whereas in fact you didn't. That was the official description of the results. If you look at the studies, uh, 
what you see is that about 80% of the subjects in those studies remember their previous choices very well. Mm -hmm. The 20% who do not tend to adjust the past to fit the present. Right. But look, that's only 20% of people. Most, the, the massive result of those studies is, well, people do remember that they had different attitudes, so they don't um, hallucinate the past. Mm -hmm. They recall it pretty well. Um, and so, but somehow, for the, for the people who run these studies, this is the boring result that you have to hide. And you have to focus on the very small uh, percentage where, where people actually sort of misremember their own past. Um, the same is true for um, studies of uh, childhood memories. Uh, where some psychologists showed that, and it's true that if you work a lot, you can actually convince people that something happened to them, which actually didn't happen to them. But the crucial thing is you have to work a lot. Um, and in all those studies, even when you tell people that uh, we have, you know, pictures of you being, I don't know, lost in a shopping mall, and they show a fake picture. And even if the psychologist recruits the, 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 the subject's uh, parents or siblings to confirm the story to lie, uh, even in those cases, there are a majority of subjects just say, no, I don't rem remember that. That's it. So, uh, so in all these cases, the, the, the mind is really working the way it should be uh, doing. I think this focus on mis dysfunction um, has a lot to do with the fact that people do not think in, in, in evolutionary and biological terms in psychology. Um, so they think that we happen to have a system that detects, uh, I don't know, for example, living things and non-living things, but they, they would think that, well, it just happens to be like that. Whereas if you think as a more sort of biologically oriented sort of psychologist, you say, well, we have that because we have to detect prey and predators, and we have to detect, you know, uh, conspecifics. So um, you will predict that these systems will have to work relatively efficiently to do what they're supposed to do. Mm -hmm. So I, I think this, but I think we're, we're, we're kind of moving away from this obsession with this function and that things are getting much better now. Mm -hmm. Uh, you know, j just a few minutes ago, when you referred to the to the case of uh, the supposed repressed memories and yeah. how people back in the eighties, some psychotherapists were able to suggest memories yeah. and yeah. then people believe them. I, I was a bit scared because I just saw a, a Freud materializing on your shoulder and he was <laughs> with a very angry face. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, that's not real. <laughs> okay. So, <laughs> so, so, uh, b by the way, you, you referred to my interview with Hugo Mercier, uh, and um, uh, about that, maybe the case of reason is a very good example to mm -hmm. just briefly talk about here, because, uh, I mean, w w what do you make of the evidence that Mercier and Sperber present about uh, the argumentative theory of reasoning? Is, is it that... Uh, I mean, b uh, scientists, for example, if they look at that data, uh, those data, they think that then we are irrational beings just because they have a view of reason that is something absolutely objective and is out right. there and is out there looking for objective truth, let's say. Mm -hmm. uh, but but Mercier and Sperber are saying that no, you shouldn't look at it that way because it was designed for another purpose. Yeah. Or or is it even that even from a strict uh, scientific perspective, it doesn't, it, it works better than people think. I, yeah, I think it's, uh, the two go together in the sense that, that, that uh, uh, Mercy and, and Sperber uh, uh, show uh, very convincingly that, that um, all sorts of things that seem a bit mysterious about the way reason work, reasoning work, that it works, that is explicit use of reasons and arguments, uh, 
um, all sorts of mysterious things about that uh, make sense if you realize that the system is not really designed to extract as much truth as possible from the environment, but it's designed to bring the most convincing case uh, to, to others in terms of uh, argumentation. And of course, that includes very often finding the best uh, evidence and having the most accurate worldview, because that is one of the best way to convince others is to have evidence that actually does uh, correspond to the way the world is. Um, so it, it, it seems that um, in the same way as for perception and memory and lots of um, social attitudes, things like that, um, psychologists got, it, it, for, for many years, had a sort of idea of what the function of that system is, which was really divorced from this actual uh, biological function. Mm -hmm. And because of that, they had this um, um, idea that, uh, well, the fact that, for example, we are lazy at reasoning when we have our, our own sort of opinion. So if you're against uh, immigration, you don't spend too much time processing the arguments against immigration, because after all, for you, they're, they're already uh, probably true. So this sort of what they call selective laziness in, in, in reasoning wouldn't make sense if uh, the point of reasoning was to uh, to extract as much truth as possible from the environment. So, but it does make sense if the point is to, uh, for example, recruit people for your coalitions, uh, for alliances and things like that. So I think that that picture is very convincing. Uh, and again, it's about reasoning, which is an explicit activity. We think, ah, oh, hang on, if he says this, it's because he means that, and he means that because he wants me to think that. That sort of thing is explicit. But again, it's floating on a notion of intuitions um, and intuitive computation that we're not aware of, like, you know, uh, the fact that we can connect what you said to, a, to your possible interests is something that just popped up in our minds because it's been computed under the surface. So explicit reasoning requires a lot of uh, implicit, intuitive kind of computation. Mm -hmm. Okay, so let's now move on to some specific topics. Let's talk about politics in small-scale traditional societies, hunter-gatherers and horticulturalists, that is basically the types of societies we evolved in, right? And, yep. then, and then maybe the sort of implications or how we do politics or how we evolve to do politics translates into modern uh, large-scale societies, let's say. So, uh, starting with the first question, um, how, how does politics basically work in small-scale societies? Because as far as I understand it, uh, they are particularly small-scale hunter-gatherer mm -hmm. societies are mostly egalitarian. That's right. So, uh they are, uh, however, that term can be a bit misleading in the sense that um, humans are special in the sense that they have hierarchies, um, um, but those hierarchies are not like in other species. You have hierarchies in other species, obviously. Um, however, they're, they're very often hierarchies of uh, what's called the hierarchies of consumption. So, for, so for example, there's uh, ranking in terms of who has access to the best food or, of course, the best mates. Um, and that's the, the, the most of, um, um, uh, of what we find. So humans have that too, of course. But um, they also have something that, that are called production hierarchies. So people organize collective action in such a way that um, efficient organization is achieved when, uh, for example, in small teams, you have someone who's more knowledgeable, uh, who takes over as uh, a sort of leader, and people who understand that for them, it's a, best, it's a better deal to extract as much competence from the leader and extract the results of collective action rather than try and be leaders themselves. So you have this dynamic of fellowship leadership that's been described by um, uh, psychologists like Mark van Vught in, in Holland and David Petrushevsky um, in, in Germany. So 
we have that. So that creates leaders. And there are in many uh, small scale societies, leaders in the sense of, you know, tribal chiefs or village chiefs, that is people who are mostly in charge of collective decision making for the group. Now, another thing we know about such groups is that uh, together with this um, uh, propensity to create a position of leader who's in charge of lots of decision making, there is a very, very strong tendency to uh, um, to limit the uh, authority of those people. Uh, that's particularly true in, uh, for example, in the example of Amazonian small scale horticultural societies, uh, where people get rid of the, the chief if the chief sort of abuses his power. Um, and also, there's a very strong pressure for, on these uh, leaders to be uh, distributors of, of, uh, of goods and resources more than accumulators. So, for, so, so in, in many small-scale societies, you cannot survive as a chief if you're not constantly redistributing uh, stuff. Mm -hmm. So uh, we have this dynamic, and I think this dynamic is, is something that is uh, one of those evolved uh, features of human uh, uh, mental architecture because uh, it's, it allows for extremely efficient collective action. So we know that there are some forms of collective action, for example, in chimps when they're hunting uh, or trying to defend a group and stuff like that. But in terms of efficiency or efficacy, it's it's really pathetic compared to what humans do in a very simple way. I mean, you know, this sort of uh, uh, is very intuitive for us that uh, we can do lots of things by getting people together, having some sort of minimal hierarchy in uh, the allocation of tasks and subtasks and so on, and share the costs and share the benefits of that collective action. That is something that comes natural, so to speak, uh, to human minds. So that's one part um, of the sort of uh, uh, natural politics, so to speak. Another part is that we're very good at forming coalitions and, uh, and uh, using those coalitions to fight against other coalitions. Alliances, you know, if, you're in a, if you work in an office with more than three people, you know, there will be some little cliques or, 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 or groups. Um, if you're in any sort of uh, social situation where you have uh, a number of people, there will be alliances between uh, different people. And very often they create this sort of rivalry uh, between uh, competing alliances. Um, so that is another part of our political psychology let, that's very let, important. Let me just ask you, that's what we call in-group, out-group dynamics, yes. right? And then people think differently about their in-groups and their out-groups. Right? That's right. And um, the reason why I didn't use that, that term, and I'm trying not to use that term too much in, um, in the book, is that um, in-group, out-group um, is the same as tribalism, is the sort of term that makes us think we have solved the question, mm -hmm. whereas we've only named it. Uh, so, yes, we, 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 we have attitudes towards outgroups that are very different from the in-group. Um, but we have to explain what are the mechanisms, and the mechanisms are the mechanisms of coalition construction. Mm -hmm. So, for example, um, um, take a simple sort of thing that, that if you're a... Um, if there are two two political parties, that's a very good example of rival coalition. <clears throat> um, this is a good example of coalitions because it's a zero-sum game. You know, if one of them wins, the other one loses, and and so on. Um, it's very clear that for people that if they are of the uh, say uh, Labour Party, um, any gain for the Conservative Party is a loss for them personally. And it's treated as a loss um, and vice versa. But also there are interesting aspects of these dynamics that really come from this coalitional psychology. Like for example, um, the dynamics of commitment. Uh, who do you want to have in your party where you want to have people who are so dedicated to the party that they're prepared to pay a huge cost to be in it. So, um, and 
why wouldn't you like, so for example, since the strength of parties depends on their numbers, after all, maybe you would like to have opportunists uh, who join your party simply because it seems to be uh, uh, in power. Uh, actually, within political parties, people hate that. They want to be with the real committed ones, not with the ones who are just joining for the right because, uh, because it's good. So uh, all these things seem completely evident to us. But actually, the, 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 the sort of computation that goes behind that is pretty complicated. It's best described in terms of game theory, and that's why microeconomists have done it very well. Uh, why don't you want uh, an opportunist to, to join your party? Well, because you think of party membership as a kind of insurance against problems in the future. Now, when the going gets rough, when there's going to be lots of problems in the future, you know, well, you kind of guess that some people will still be on board with you and others will leave. So you, you, you want to monitor which ones will, will, be, will stay with you. And for example, the people who paid a big price for joining the party. So for example, uh, people who had to leave their family, their friends to be with you. Um, are more likely to be uh, the ones you want. Now, all this seems completely obvious to us, just like it seems obvious to us that if I'm looking at this candy, it's because I want this candy. But once again, it requires complex computations. And the proof is that when you try to describe them, you get, you get something like game theory, which is not easy to understand. You have to you know, uh, do formula after formula to understand exactly why things work that, that way. So uh, leadership and fellowship, and coalitional psychology, there are two sort of ways in which we organize groups and interaction within groups. And those are there uh, in um, our, in the way we construct small groups, but also in the way we construct nations, ethnicities, and things like that. And that's a crucial sort of point that really it works the same way. Uh, you know, we don't have a special psychology for ethnic group as opposed to uh, small units. Uh, we don't have a special psychology for political groups as opposed to uh, hunting uh, bands. This is all the same psychology, really. Mm -hmm. uh, and this sort of uh, coalitionist psychology that we've evolved, I mean, it works in undergather or the culturalist groups. Is it the case that in order for us to move from those types of small-scale societies up to, for example, chiefdoms and states yeah, yes. and empires and even modern nations with hundreds of millions of people yeah. or tens of millions of people, that we need some sort of a cultural element working there, for example, to expand uh, our group identity? Yes. Well, uh I, I don't think there's a contrast here between cultural and non-cultural uh, products in a sense that uh, all this is what our culture is, you know, these sort of notions of followers and all that. They are things that we transmit to each other because we're expecting them to, to be there. Now, it's true that uh, scaling up to large groups um, still uses that same psychology and very often has to rely on uh, on uh, institutions, that is, on um, ways of describing the dynamics of groups that make it possible to think of them in terms of small group dynamics, even though they're not. Um, so, uh, um, and it, it, does it, that include things like religion and systems of law and things like that? Well, systems of law is a special sort of um, um, way in which we, we, we manage to codify something and to sort of um, make more transparent to everyone mm -hmm. uh, the very complex interactions you have in a complex society. So if you, um, the point is that um, at some point what you do is that you abstract um, away from the actual interactions between people and you describe them in simplistic terms and that is what institutions do. So for example institutions tell you that um, 
uh, the way you contribute to society is by paying taxes to the government, the state. Okay, as if the state was an agent, or and that's the way we represent it mentally. The and state is an already, agent. That's already folk sociology, right? Yeah, yeah, that's what I call folk sociology. That we we think, well, the state is an agent, and we give that money to the state, and the state is a distributive sort of agent that that uh, that does stuff for us. Mm -hmm. So then we have elections, we think of that in terms of trying to convince that agent to do certain things and not others. Um, so, so in that way, the psychology we use for these things is, is very similar um, to the one we used in small groups. And that's why it's often difficult to understand what is going on in large groups because um, or large societies because we apply a, a psychology that um, that doesn't take into account the complexity of interaction and the emergent effects of interaction. Mm -hmm. um, so um, there's one example I, I really like and I use in the book that's, that's from um, a great economist, uh, Timur Koran, who um, describes um, ethnic signals, for example. So, um, and what he calls uh, cascades of reputation. Um, and this is a very simple thing. Um, in some places, like for example, some uh, Muslim countries where you have conflict between the Islamist kind of uh, faction and the secular uh, government, often the army as well, um, kind of group, you have this fluctuating situation where sometimes the, um, uh, the army or the secular party seem to be sort of uh, 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 getting more influence, so sometimes it's the other guys. Uh, and you see that people sort of change their, uh, the, the, the way they signal their identity uh, so that men will grow a beard or will start shaving a beard and will uh, dress in more sort of uh, traditional Islamic ways or not. Now, when you look at these things, you see that it's really uh, these waves uh, are very sudden so that sometime, at some point, almost everyone seems to have joined the Islamic faction. At some point, almost everyone seems to have joined the, the secular faction. But of course, it's not like that. It's not that people's preferences have changed. It's that their perception of other people's preferences have changed. And at some point, when you perceive that the wave is going in a particular way, you should go that way. But by doing that, you make it even more visible to others that the, the, the wave is going this way. This is the kind of emergent effect that you can describe um, in mathematical terms, as a dynamical system, or, you know, in economic uh, terms, perhaps more simply. But our human mind, is not, human mind is not equipped to deal with that kind of complexity. So, uh, when we see that, for example, most people around us are beginning to show that they are very patriotic or very, um, or the other way, um, what we think is they all change their mind mm -hmm. and they're all expressing their preferences. We don't see it as a sort of emergent effect of all these complex communications between lots of agents. Mm -hmm. So we misunderstand these phenomena. Um, and a typical example of that also that I really like, and um, it, it was also studied by Timur Koran, is those sudden losses of authority from some governments like, you know, uh, uh, in Romania, it seems like, you know, you, you cannot sneeze until, unless uh, Ceausescu is, has allowed it. So it seems like the power is incredibly strong in the power. And in a few days, it's gone. Mm -hmm. um, right. So, you know, our intuitive view of politics cannot explain that because we, can't exp because we think the power is strong because everyone preferred to obey it. And then it's all weak because everyone prefers to disobey. But then it seems that all of a sudden they all change their minds. Now, this kind of phenomenon is a sort of intrinsically dynamical sort of uh, phenomenon. But we think of people of other people's preferences spontaneously in terms of one single mind that has preferences. We don't think about the interaction. So it's very difficult to understand for us intuitively. Of course, social scientists can describe the way it works, but it's difficult for us to, to see it that way. So would you say then that in large scale societies, 
people create or feel the need to create these social institutions and group signals and symbols for, for them to be able to identify their group members, let's say, for them to be able to more easily reduce uncertainty when they're going to interact with another person because they aren't able to keep track of yeah. millions of people out there and they don't even know them. Exactly. Uh, there's this sort of situation, you know, um, uh, why is it that uh, if you get stopped by the police, you have to stop? And if they ask to see your uh, ID, you have to show your ID. Well, if you want to look at it um, in very sort of strict terms, why does that happen that you feel you have to do it? You have to go through all sorts of complex interactions between the the, uh, the police uh, officer and their superiors, their superiors and their superiors, the superiors and the people who hire them, the people who pay them and so on and so forth. You have a huge and very complex kind of um, uh, set of interactions that result in this. So uh, that is not accessible to human minds as such. I mean, because that's uh, that's not very easy to represent explicitly. So what we do is we th we say, well, this guy has power, uh, and we see it as some sort of quality that was given to him by the government, and that's it. Um, and once we have that, we can adjust our behavior and we know that you know if they ask for an ID we should provide it uh, that's it otherwise lots of bad stuff will happen uh, so we've reduced the complexity of this actual situation institutional situation to something that makes sense in terms of uh, small group politics and I think we do that a lot um, uh, and that's another aspect of folk sociology, that yeah, is that yeah. people tend to think about power as a force that mm -hmm. operates in society. That's right. And that's, um, you know, the government has power um, and uh, that explains why it can do certain things, why we have to sort of uh, comply with what its representatives are telling us and so on and so forth. Um, and. Political scientists, of course, will tell you, well, but that's not the, the, the way it happens because there is no magical substance that's there, you know, uh, contained somewhere in the Kremlin, you know, a little box where they have the power. Uh, well, and the proof well, of that, I, well, I don't know about the Kremlin because <laughs> things that happen there are really weird. So. Yeah, well, we'll, yes, we'll need more research on that because the... Uh, but so it's not like there is a, a mis uh, mysterious source of um, force like that. It's more that the complex interactions make it uh, are, are difficult to describe for a human mind. But they make it the case that, yes, you have an advantage if you comply with a state uh, representative in, in most circumstances. And you have lots of lots of problems if you don't. Um, and, you know, computing all these contingencies would be far more com far too complex and it wouldn't yield a very different result. That's the thing uh, that, you know, even if you think of all these um, uh, interactions that make it possible for some people to have power over others, uh, then in the end, you will just describe a situation in the same way as someone who has the naive sociology view that, well, this person has power. You will predict the same behaviors. So it's only in cases where things, for example, change suddenly, like uh, Ceausescu had lots of power, he has zero power. Uh, it's only in some in, in situations like that that we see that our naive theory of power is wrong, certainly, uh, because it doesn't explain the, that phenomenon. But otherwise, in, in everyday life, it works per perfectly well. I mean, it sort of it predicts what will happen. Uh, it tells you what's the best way to behave. So... Uh, that's why it's, it's, I mean, naive sociology, what I call folk sociology is, is often inaccurate, um, but it's very useful. Uh, so we've basically been talking about the psychological mechanisms that allowed for us to expand our yeah. societies, but that's the how. But uh, do, do we already have a good understanding as to why we expanded our societies over time, or at least 
in certain places because I mean we still have hunter gather bands yeah, sure. and tribes yeah. out there. So some of the uh, some of the societies that we have didn't expand or at least didn't have enough time to expand. But is uh, and per I'm particularly interested in the aspect of hierarchy or hierarchy building because uh, as we move on from. Uh, bands to tribes to shift them states and so on it seems that uh, hierarchies get more and more rigid uh, rigid at least in certain aspects in the sense That's that true. it's easier yeah. for us to have one leader that has absolute power over mm -hmm. the entire society and things like that uh, the, the, does that happen mainly because as we move on, and particularly when societies acquire agriculture, it's easier for them to accumulate more resources, and sure. these resources accumulate, and then as people specialize, because societies start getting more and more complex, and then we, you have people that work in agriculture, for example, sure. and others in metallurgy, and others, I mean, whatever, whatever their, their professions. And so, uh, it's... It, it it seems to me that uh, as resources accumulate, it's also it's also easier for one person that rises above all the rest to uh, to exert more power over them or something like that. It's possible, but it's not um, it's not a simple sort of um, trajectory. And and the um, one of the one of the anthropologists who's really uh, worked on that and sort of summarized what we know of these uh, development towards larger societies and state societies is James Scott, um, who's uh, who just sort of you know summarizes and synthesizes lots of work from archaeologists and uh, lots of archaeology these days shows that um, with the beginnings of um, early agriculture, which doesn't mean having fields and stuff like that, it means having a sudden uh, control over uh, the ecology. Uh, with the development of those things, you get larger and larger communities. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, how these communities are organized is, we don't really know because we haven't seen them, but um, it seems that uh, the, the, the development of state institutions occurs long after you've had these uh, large communities. In other words, the state is not indispensable for this kind of development. Mm -hmm. So what you get when you get state institutions is that some group manages to act as a sort of predator and uh, control more and more of the, 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 the rest of the society by uh, managing to impose by force uh, taxation and things like that. Um, the idea that we have of the modern state as, uh, as, um, um, as providing services is is a bit of a distortion it's a very recent sort of thing you know where the, the the archaic states do not do anything for their citizens except tax them mm -hmm. um and uh you could say that they protect them against foreign invasions but it's because they want their tax base to stay where it is you know they don't want the <laughs> people to be you know the 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 the, the, the pharaoh doesn't want his uh, population to be massacred simply because they produce uh, you know tax right uh, Taxes. So, um, so these two are different things, you know, the development of the state as a special kind of hierarchy and the development of large scale groups that have their own sort of uh, flatter hierarchies are two different things. Now, as to the why, it seems that it's quite clear that trade trade and the division of labor are what creates uh, huge um, improvements in efficiency, which creates lots of very large communities. That's the only way you get there. Um, as long as you do not specialize, you stay in groups of 20 or 200 people. Uh, when you start having strong division of labor, but you need lots of people to have. So there's a, a kind of uh, uh, feedback loop uh, that um, if you have a sufficient number of people 
in certain kinds of ecology, you can have lots of division of labor. Once you have that, you have huge gains in efficiency, which means that you can have more and more people around. Uh, and also that the circle of trade between uh, different people can expand a lot. So it, 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 it seems that the intensity of um, um, division of labor within groups is what uh, what drove this uh, th th uh, this phenomenon of, of having larger and larger communities. Uh, but then the other dynamic, which is the um, appro appropriation uh, of lots of resources by what economists would call, you know, a stationary bandit, that is the state that is there, is mugging you basically, but you can't escape because they're there and they will not move. Um, uh, that's another dynamic that's very different. And would it make sense that uh, that dynamic occurs of a, a central power there? Because uh, if, if we have division of labor, then it's easier for us to have some sort of central power to coordinate all of the different activities. Well, it would seem that way, but actually... Um, it, in, in archaic states or, you know, uh, primitive states for which we have some documentation, um, it's not the case that the state is uh, actually coordinating activity except by forcing people to engage in activities that would, uh, that will uh, produce tax, uh, you know, wealth. Um, but apart from that, no, I mean, the, 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 the way uh, division of labor um, I mean, that's a classical argument from economists, and I think is is obviously correct in, in most cases, which is that division of labor um, arises spontaneously because of comparative advantage. You realize that you can do more um, than others, but, but also um, it creates its own coordination. That is uh, in the sense that, you know, if, if, if there are already lots of very competent bakers or butchers, it's, it makes no sense for you to specialize in butchery or baking. Um, and therefore, the, 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 the sort of the extent to which we have market exchanges will create coordination, spontaneous order of markets, if you want. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that's very largely the case. And it, it, it's, 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 it often seems to us that you need lots of um, uh, organization, state organization in particular, um, to create uh, order and uh, efficient allocations. Mm -hmm. uh, but that's very often an illusion. I mean, that's, uh, you know, the, um, um, I, I, I remember uh, uh, moving from places that have a ministry of education that appoints teachers in schools uh, to places where that institution, that ministry, just does not exist. Mm -hmm. And if I tell people in some European countries where they have a ministry of education that, well, in other places they don't have one, they say, oh, how do, you know, schools get teachers? I mean, why, you know, they must be lost sort of trying to, uh, running around like headless chickens and, and trying to... <laughs> To, to find teachers, and I say, no, it's exactly the same way as, you know, your baker or your butcher uh, get people to help them uh, bake and butcher. Uh, they just do it by hiring the people who seem competent at the job, and that's it. Uh, so, in the end, uh, in those countries without a ministry of education, you get schools that teach kids. It, and it's more or less the same way as in many countries that have them. So, you don't need a ministry of baking. Um, and you don't need one for education. So, because there's lots of spontaneous order, but that's also something that um, I would say um, is difficult for us to to think about because we we tend to think that 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 human beings um, are not designed to live in groups with complex interaction, whereas in fact we are. And we do create spontaneous order, we do create cooperation, we do create, you know, uh, easy coordination of behavior between people. That's how we, uh, that's a feature of our species. Um, we don't need authorities to do that, to, to tell us that, you know, uh, 
people sort of stand in line to get something from the store and they know the rules of standing in line. It's not because there's a law about standing in line. It's, it's just, you know, they manage to create that norm between themselves spontaneously. Mm -hmm. So even when people think about hunter-gatherer societies just because they don't have, uh, let's say, a system of law in place and enforced, uh, uh, they talk about them as anarchies. I mean, that's right. also not a proper way. No, of thinking I don't about think it. it's not the the proper way of thinking about it because anarchism in in uh, modern politics has been a project that has to do with um, very special things and 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 also. Um, uh, when we call that anarchism, people would think that it has to do with um, unlimited sort of self-expression. Uh, and in fact, it includes that, but the, the way people manage politics in uh, small-scale societies, it's also through a huge amount of cooperation, uh, generous exchange, you know, sharing and things like that, where um, you create a collective goods and you create uh, welfare for lots of people by acting in a way that's other directed rather than selfish. So uh, that's part of our nature. And, uh, you know, that's one of those things in uh, that uh, we get from a sort of uh, mythology we have of nature as selfish and culture as sharing and stuff like that. Well, uh, human nature is not uh, just selfish. It includes morality, cooperation, all these things. These are parts of our uh, of our evolved sort of dispositions, motivations. Mm -hmm. Okay, so let's now move on to another topic, uh, and this interests me a lot. That is the one of gender roles, uh, uh -huh. and I guess that this is another topic, unless you are a Marxist, and then for you it's all politics. <laughs> Anyway, so, um, okay, but, but this, this, is, this also has something to do with politics in a way because um, the way p um, women establish relationships with other people and the way men do so also has some bearing, at least from an evolutionary perspective, on how our societies are structured and... Mm -hmm. That's probably also why uh, throughout the world and even looking back in time, I, I mean, practically all of the societies that we have studied are patriarchal, right? Right, uh, sure. And, and um, the, uh, what... Um, what lots of people find a bit sort of um, uh, annoying about those topics is that they um, they're prepared to 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 adopt a position that's based on what uh, we call naturalistic fallacy. That is to think that if you sort of uh, describe uh, a certain set of preferences and motivations as the result of evolution, you are saying uh, that they're good. Uh, that they're the right choice. Uh, and also you're saying that they're uh, immovable, they're unchangeable. So uh, to give you uh, uh, a simple example, it's quite clear uh, that most of um, human warfare uh, throughout human evolution uh, consisted in raids where you kill the men and you um, abduct the women. The, that's what the warriors do, and the warriors are men. Um, okay, is that a great way to live in society? Well, we tend to think no, and we've created institutions that make it possible. You know, if you live in St. Louis, to not be at war with Chicago, or you know, between Lisbon and Coimbra, or between you know all these places. So, uh, so we've we've managed that. Or to get another, take another example. Um, it's quite clear that in many circumstances, uh, in small-scale places with no, you know, uh, refined technology, mm -hmm. uh, when an infant seems to be weak, uh, people will just neglect it until it, until it dies. Mm -hmm. 
Okay, let's call selective infanticide and there's lots of evidence that it does happen. Is that good? No. <laughs> uh, we shouldn't do that. Um, and actually, as soon as we have the means not to do that, we can create systems to not do that. So now we, we, we save those infants. Okay, so moving on to gender roles. Um, I think the, 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 the way we see these things in evolutionary anthropology is that human evolution um, at some uh, um, uh, changes at some point that is between maybe six or five hundred thousand years ago and um, hundred thousand years ago and, and gradually which is that we get um, we get fire which means that we cook food and we get lots of very efficient hunting of large prey that is more efficient. Now, these things have one consequence, which is that they make they make it possible to evolve uh, more complex brains, larger brains. Okay, so brains are extremely expensive in carries. So you need lots of carries, especially to grow them. So you grow larger brains because we have more efficient food. Um, cooked food is pre-digested, so it's better for organism and so on and so forth. Now, because we have those large brains, we have large babies. Um, and um, as uh, lots of biological anthropologists have noted, the problem with large babies is that it's difficult to give birth to large babies because they're large. So uh, evolution could solve this question by uh, putting a pressure on women to have larger, larger pelvis, but it's not possible because we walk upright, so we need a, a narrow pelvis. So there's another solution, which is to have babies that are born before they're totally ready. That's called neoteny, and that's typical of humans, that uh, the, the babies are born and are extremely uh, fragile and helpless and so on and so forth, which means that they need lots and lots of new, uh, nurturing. Mm -hmm. And the period of uh, juvenile, uh, child and juvenile phase in humans is much longer than it is in other primates. So it means lots of taking care of those infants. Mm -hmm. Now you get to that situation where um, in uh, most primate uh, species, it's females that, that uh, protect the infants and males that do not protect them because males have other interests because uh, males can go from one female to another and, and uh, their genetic interest is not exactly to nurture each um, of their own. So, uh, but in humans, it's a bit different and uh, fathers invest huge amount of attention and protection on on nurturing uh, infants, mostly by doing uh, something uh, which is um, at which they have a comparative advantage over women, they're slightly better, which is hunting. And now we're back at that circle where hunting becomes better and men become better at it because also they have larger brains, which makes them, uh, you know, and, it's, and all this is documented. We know, we know that techniques of hunting and all that have changed and have become more and more sophisticated. So by the, you know, even sort of middle Paleolithic, you have people uh, pushing herds of uh, animals into ravines and things like that, things that require coordination between lots of different human beings in order to achieve that, that effect, um, but also planning and things like that. So you get this circle, and this circle uh, of hunting and cooking the bigger brains, bigger heads, more nurturing, more attention by uh, by both men and women, but men doing more of the hunting and women more of the gathering. So this creates a division of labor where uh, it's not that women cannot hunt or men cannot gather foods, but it's just that women are less competitive in terms of, uh, less, sorry, economically competitive, efficient um, in terms of hunting than men. And that creates a situation where you have couples that is large commitment between one man and one woman mm -hmm. uh, in terms of economic solidarity that what he brings will be mostly for uh, her and, uh, and the offspring. Um, and there is a sort of contract that seems to emerge that creates couples where uh, men provide uh, goods and also protection against other men. Mm -hmm. Yeah. In exchange for protect, protection from infanticide, for example, from infanticide, from uh, rape, from attacks, and so on and so forth. 
that men provide that and what women provide against that so people used to have this naive view that men hunt and women provide sex in in exchange for meat and it was called meat for sex and i think that's very misleading because first of all it's not just meat it's protection and and uh, and nurturing of infants uh, that fathers provide but also uh, what women provide is not sex it's exclusive sex so um because of the genetic imperative not to provide for offspring that is not yours, uh, that is cuckoldry, um, men are biased towards providing, um, uh, to providing more in situations where they have more certainty that offspring is theirs. Mm -hmm. Okay, so now, yet you have all this sort of evolutionary dynamic going on for hundreds of thousands of years, uh, you get all sorts of results, which are propensities or motivations that are different in men and women. Uh, for example, men are more interested in collective action with other men in order to achieve collective results. And, for example, they do warfare or coalitional rivalry pretty good. Uh, they're motivated for that, they don't mind that, they don't mind the danger of that, and so on and so forth. Uh, women are more interested in small-scale networks of relationships between individuals and deep collaboration long-term with individuals. Uh, men are slightly stronger, in, uh, yeah, uh, slightly stronger overall, but they're very much stronger in terms of upper body strength, which matters for fighting. Mm -hmm. but, by the way, in uh, terms so of... So in terms of how women establish relationships, we also have to take into account the phenomenon of cooperative breeding, right? Right. So there are several uh, things that, that uh, uh, people have noticed that, that, that may explain uh, these different psychology of group uh, relations and uh, social relations. So uh, first of all, um, most uh, human groups, it seems, over... Uh, evolutionary sort of ancestral uh, conditions um, were philopatric so that uh, men stay with their brothers in a group and women move to another group after try after their, their adults to 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 join uh, a husband we would say um, so that be that puts different pressure on male sociality and female sociality in the sense that uh, men are in groups where they can count on the solidarity of the group, mostly because it's largely sort of um, relate, genetically related or at least sort of um, distant kin. Uh, women, on the other hand, have to produce social relations with people who are not genetically related with them. Uh, and they have, so they have to invest in uh, cooperation and Alloparenting, for example, is one of the forms that this takes in the sense that uh, it's a good deal for uh, women in lots of those societies to share uh, the, 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 the tasks of parenting. So, for example, especially in terms of um, older sort of infants and we, we, who require mostly monitoring. Uh, and uh, that is something that can be shared and seems to be shared in lots of uh, human groups. Uh, so... It would seem, so we, we see these different sort of selective pressures for different kinds of social arrangements or social relations. And it seems that to a large degree, uh, we see them in the modern world. Um, and that if you put people in, um, in large um, social um, uh, uh, groups, like for example, a corporation, uh, you'll find that men and women sort of uh, tend to uh, organize their social networks of who they can trust and so on and so forth in slightly different ways. Uh, uh, um, there's an economist, Paul Seabright, who studied these things and, and sort of says that, well, we do see that, that difference. It's not a huge difference in the sense that, of course, both are capable of doing what the other agenda typically does, but that's, that's not the problem. It's the problem of genetic on average, a, a preference. We see it in, um, it seems, in uh, the way young kids play in playgrounds that um, girls seem to have more, uh, a, a smaller group uh, of friends they play with, uh, but very stable relationships uh, with these uh, other girls. And young boys seem to recruit 
uh, uh, large coalitions of other boys to do something, and then these coalitions sort of uh, disappear, and another one gets created. So we do find these differences in in social life, but also in terms of preferences. I mean, in terms of uh, all sorts of um, things. I mean, the, it's it's uh, it's very much a pity that these things in many places and um, American universities are among those. Um, are becoming uh, so politicized that it's it's very difficult to talk about them. Uh, yes. So you know, um, but you know, as far as we know, the evidence seems to suggest that we do have these differences. Um, one part, one bit of evidence that is very interesting in that respect is to compare. Uh, nations that have more and more sort of um, gender gen equality. Yes, right, gender equality in the law and things like that. And uh, the, the the result that seems to emerge is that as you give men and women more and more sort of means to do whatever they want, like, you know, have long or short uh, pants or leave, have it for the dad or the mom, or and so on and so forth, what you get is more and more difference between the sexes, not less difference. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. uh, which, you know, suggests that, yeah, yeah, there are different preferences, and that's it. Um, it's, it's, um, I think the the unfortunate sort of result of the politicization of all this stuff is um, is that we may see a sort of return of this sort of idea that um, evolution and genetics are evil, and, um, and 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 that's not good news. But anyway, that's yeah. uh, that's where we are. Yeah, and it's interesting now that you talk about that, the backlash against innate sex differences, let's say, then there are some feminists that go out and look for some uh, rare examples of societies. I, I'm not even talking about matriarchal, matriarchal no. societies, because I'm not even sure if there's a single one of <laughs> no. that. But... Uh, there are, I think that it is, uh, or it was, I'm not sure if those societies still exist, but in some islands of the, in the Pacific, there were some societies that seems that they were matrilineal and matrilocal. Oh, yeah, but that's different. But, but, yeah. but that's yeah. because they, yeah. they, they had some very specific ecological circumstances there. Sure. And it's not random because basically I think that what happened there is that their food economy was based mostly on fish and fishing. And so since the husbands were, were out uh, for long yeah, sure. periods of time fishing and they couldn't be uh, sure uh, or I mean th there's that phenomenon of mm. uh, parental uncertainty and so they yeah. because they left their women yeah. uh, back uh, they couldn't yeah. be sure that they were the father the real fathers then it seems that most of the investment came from the mother's brother or sure. the, the exactly. children's yeah. uncles yeah. and so yeah. I, I mean even that it's not random or purely no. cultural it's just Due no, I mean, to the ecological circumstances. The the thing is that uh, so I mean uh, uh, yes, there's been lots of uh, confusion about that. I mean, a, a matrilineal society is not one where, or matrilocal is not one where uh, women are in charge. Um, it, it's one where you count descent from from uh, the mother's line, which means that basically sure. instead of a child being bossed over by their father, they will be bossed over by their mother's brother, by their uncle, paternal uncle, who's the one in power. Um, another thing is that when we say that there's a differential in, in power, uh, you have to realize that the all we can say on evolutionary grounds is that men tend to have more um, control over the affairs of the group in terms of relationship with other groups, mm -hmm. um, mostly in that respect, because uh, we lived in, uh, we evolved in, in, in a context where we had some cooperation and some warfare between groups. And uh, warfare is exclusively a male sort of thing because the evolutionary dangers 
of uh, that kind of fighting for women are so much larger than for men that um, the fitness sorry uh, problems are so much larger the, that it's it's uh, men who do it uh, which means that it's men who do warfare which means that it's men who who basically sort of um, are concerned and are in charge of intergroup relations now as far as uh, things happen within groups which is a kind of less overt form of authority um, it's quite clear in most small-scale societies that there's no real sort of gender difference in the sense that there may be more of a sort of spectacle of power that is uh, male uh, but in terms of actual decision making, you know, who marries whom, uh, you know, uh, that sort of thing. Um, that, yeah, I mean, there's uh, obviously a, a huge amount of influence from, from women. Again, the, the thing is that the uh, one unfortunate um, uh, consequence of thing, seeing things in terms of um, men versus women uh, is that, of course, biologically it cannot make sense in the sense that um, men do not really have interests that would be the interests of all males against all females. Mm -hmm. Because biologically, you know, in terms of fitness, the fitness of a man depends on his daughters, his sisters, his mother, I mean, that's uh, too late, but his sisters, his, his daughters. So uh, it's uh, what evolution would predict is that men will not privilege men against women and women will not privilege women against men. Uh, everyone will try to, advantage, to give advantages to their relatives against everyone else. Uh, that's what we, we know from kin selection. It seems to work very much like that. So, um, you know, it's, um, so, you know, in, in lots of journalistic sort of descriptions of all these things, we, we, we see the societies where gender arrangements, for example, are a bit different. Mm -hmm. And we think of them in terms of the men versus the women, but that's not the way it works, either there or here. It's not the same. It's not sure. Uh, it's the same. It's not sure uh, in those terms. It's in terms of how do you maximize the advantages to people who are either your coalitional allies or your kin. Right. Right. Uh, and also it doesn't make sense because another phenomenon that we have in, in evolutionary biology and in other species and ours as well is uh, intrasexual competition. That is, yeah, it wouldn't course. make sense for an entire gender to be yes, against yes, the yes, other. Yes. <laughs> yes, exactly. I mean, you know, the, 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 uh, uh, it, it's, it's absolutely not in a man's interest that other men are in positions of power and influence. Sure. It's, it's his interest that he and his kin are in positions of power and influence. For the other men, they can drop dead. It doesn't matter. It's even better because they're, you know, in terms of competition for mating, uh, they won't be um, as, as dangerous. Yeah, and if there weren't even any other men, it would be better because yeah. The, uh, yeah. the, uh, the underlying optimized sexual strategy for men is to try to impregnate as many women as yeah, they sure. can. Yeah, sure. If they can. So, yes, uh, the, 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 that's the thing. I mean, eliminating competition is always good. And that, I mean, in that sense, um, that's it's the same in the market. You know, uh, even Adam Smith, you know, noticed that um, competition is wonderful uh, for efficiency and so on. Uh, however, when, as he said, when you get two businessmen together, you have to be very suspicious because they're trying to rig the market against everyone else. So it's the same, you know, uh, uh, you, 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 you don't like competition, so you don't want this sort of uh, situation. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, so since I'm talking with you, a topic that we can't exclude is the one of religion, right? So <laughs> I, I have to ask you, I have to ask you two or three questions about this. So the first one is, um, I, I, does it make sense, I mean, from an evolutionary anthropological perspective to talk about phenomena that are so different in different societies, particularly yeah. if we are comparing shamanic religion, for example, yeah. Yeah. Uh, with a more modern 
uh, expressions of religion like polytheism or monotheism? Does yeah. it make sense to crunch it all together under the rubric no. of, a, of a single phenomenon called religion? No, I think it's that's extraordinarily misleading. Uh, the problem about that is that, well, yes, okay, first of all, it's misleading in the sense that um, you have all sorts of characteristics of what we think is uh, religion, and we think it's present in all sorts of places, including in uh, other small-scale societies. Uh, so we think that, for example, uh, uh, if you have religious activities, you have to have a doctrine that says, you know, what's, uh, what's what, what the gods and spirits are, what they can do, etc. And that people believe that doctrine and they agree on what the doctrine is. Um, we also think that there are specialists um, that are trained, that there is a community of believers. Right. Uh, and when we go to small scale, small scale societies of the one we evolved in, all these things are false. So there is no um, um, doctrine really. I mean, it, in those places where people have a shaman, for example, and, and, and um, who deals with souls, if you ask lots of people what those souls are like, what they can do and all that, either you get no answer because people will say, well, why, how should I know these things? You know, I'm not a specialist. Or you get as many answers as there are people because it does not matter in a way. Um, also, there's something that is very, very different, which is that um, religions in a doctrinal sense of organized religion to 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 give to use the convenient term, um, organized religion has institutions. It has big organizations like churches and stuff like that, mm -hmm. and it does all sorts of stuff. It produces ideas about all sorts of things like morality, like uh, you know uh, the organization of society, and so on and so forth. Now, what what you have in small scale societies is only practical stuff. That is specialists like shamans. That's a convenient term. Uh, whose job is to either palliate uh, or uh, prevent misfortune, like mm -hmm. illness, uh, bad crops, accidents, things like that. Mm -hmm. That's the only thing there is. Uh, people do not think about the spirits unless they think something bad may happen or something bad has happened. Uh, you know, it's, they don't have faith in that sense. It's not a part of their life that uh, is important in that way. So, um, when we say where well, religion is this, religion is that, we're very often projecting the features of this um, onto the others. So we think that there are believers in shamanism. No, there are no believers in shamanism. People go to the shaman like you go to the dentist. You know, so if you if you go to the dentist, that doesn't mean you've joined the congregation of believers in dentistry. Okay, so it just means you think this person has the competence to remedy a problem that you have. That's it. So, uh, it's very misleading to talk in, the, in that way. However, I must say that I'm very pessimistic about these things because it seems to me that um, that's one of the problems about the social sciences, that um, it's a very general situation. So, it makes no sense to talk about religion in general because we have these two very different situations. Okay. Uh, you can argue that point forever and you can make it very convincing and people, not just me, have tried to make it uh, convincing to illustrate it to, you know, um, like anthropologists like Harvey Whitehouse or, you know, people like that have done all that work to, to, to show these differences and so on. Right. And then people come back to you and say, so, but what's your theory of religion? <laughs> so, you know, there's no, you know... Um, so it's it's very difficult, and I think the reason for that is that religion, in the sense of relig um, religious organizations and all that, is present in our societies and is pretty important. Uh, it has lots of, uh, it creates lots of problems. It may create uh, lots of uh, good things. We don't know, but um, because of that, we think it's really something that has to be uh, one uh, big feature of human life. Um, and, it's, it, and, and one important feature that is there that requires a special theory and explanation. I don't think that's true. Um, so I, I often take those analogies like saying, you know, trees. Trees seem to be one kind of thing, uh, but they're not one kind of thing. Uh, 
uh, the trees biologically belong to two or three different, very different biological families. Um, so you don't have an, an evolutionary biology of trees. That doesn't make sense because you have to talk about w which of these different families you're talking about. Okay, uh, that's fine. And people will say, yes, yes, yes. And then they ask me, well, what's your theory of religion? So uh, I, th I think it's very difficult to go against the... I mean, imagine you're a political scientist and you think uh, there's no such thing as political power. There are two very different things there. And you write about this difference for 600 pages and you demonstrate it and everyone uh, agrees that's fantastic. But then people will tell you, so what's the theory of political power? Where does it come from? So I, 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 I'm a bit pessimistic about um, social sciences um, being able to uh, influence people's um, uh, opinions and debates about these things. Um, I, I, I think it's sometimes it's uh, it's an uphill struggle. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and and another thing that just came to my mind. Uh, I, I don't know if you read this, but but I think it it came out last week or something. Uh, a, a massive report based on a study done by several uh, universities, I think in the UK, that was called Understanding Unbelief, Atheists and Agnostics Around the World. And I, I'm not sure to what extent this is relevant here. But uh, one very interesting thing that they found is that in people across the world that identify as atheists, for example, mm. they found that those self-identified atheists still believe in things like life after oh, yeah. death. Sure, so, yeah. yeah. So, so, so I, I mean, isn't this also a problem here? Because couldn't it be the case that sometimes what people are associating with religion, maybe it's just an underlying feature of human innate oh. cognition that gets sure. expressed at other levels yeah. of uh, people's cultural manifestations, for example. Yes, I, I, I think the um, uh, what we call religious representations are only a subset in um, ideas and uh, fantasies about um, what I called supernatural sort of uh, situations, you know, or sort of concepts, which you find in fantasies and dreams in uh, in stories and things like that. Uh, so it's true that there's lots of um, um, uh, beliefs and ideas that in the old days we would have called superstitions. Uh, and uh, now we don't do that because we think that's a bit sort of demeaning and derogatory, but, but actually so. Uh, so you get lots of that sort of floating around. And of course, it's, it's just like you get lots of conspiracy theories. It's the same sort of ideas. Um, but they're not organized in large groups. So we think, oh, that's different from religion. Uh, and and so, but that's not very different from religion. It's just that it hasn't coalesced in some big organization. It could become like that someday, or it might just disappear, and that's that's it. But it's just the historical development of some sets of ideas like that makes them into what we call religion, because they have you know buildings, rituals, specialists, and so on. Um, as for the atheist and, and agnostic kind of thing. Um, I'm really suspicious. I've seen studies like that, um, um, and I'm very suspicious of that for lots of reasons. But one of them is that it's in in the social sciences. You should not, uh, in general, take people's self description as uh, an unproblematic independent variable. So uh, I tell you, for example. Um, if you ask a, um, a French or German person if they're atheists or, you know, many of them would just say yes, in the sense that, you know, the, the religion in terms of God and all that doesn't have much of a, an effect in their lives. If you ask that question in the United States, it's completely different um, uh, because atheist in the U.S. means something who is a militant against organized religion. Okay, an activist. Um, so um, 
so for example, you get that weird situation that uh, most people in the U.S. say that they wouldn't want their children to marry an atheist. Mm, right. If you ask that in an opinion poll, you find that. And you might think, my God, these Americans, they're obsessed with religion. Blah, blah. No, I mean, they're actually they're more religious than in other places. But uh, the thing is that if they, the prospective son-in-law or daughter-in-law happens to be someone who doesn't go to church or temple or whatever and is not really concerned with that, they won't even notice it in many cases. So what they mean by atheist is someone who spends a lot of his time or her time on the web fulminating against religion. Uh, so, you know, the, these labels mean such different things in different cultures that it's, it's very misleading. Plus, um, I think in general what you should look at is uh, the extent to which uh, participation in these, uh, in particular religious activities, have uh, import have some importance in people's decision making, mm -hmm. and then you see sort of difference that uh, so, um, for example, the um, uh, uh, for example, you could you could see that um, you take situations like Italy, and I. I'm sure you'll have to correct me that Portugal is probably like that too. Officially totally Catholic. Uh, most people are not super interested in, uh, in uh, the Catholic dogma or activities. However, they get baptized and married and buried in church by the Catholic Church. In other words, the Catholic Church provides services. <laughs> These services are for rites of passage like birth, you know, uh, marriage and, and death. That yeah, mean, what happens a lot in Portugal, I'm not sure if it's the same in Italy, but probably, is that people uh, resort to the church to make these uh, sort of rituals, as you say, like right. marriage yep. and yep. things like that. But there are lots and lots of people that don't even go to the Mass on Sunday. Exactly. Sorry. So uh, the idea is that, well, the, the, the church in those situations has found a niche where it provides very limited services, but it's seen as the good provider of those services. Mm -hmm. Now, would you describe that as people who are religious, atheists, whatever? It, it seems to me it's, you know, these labels are really meaningless. Uh, compare that to um, uh, situations where people's lives is really, uh, you know, imbued with uh, beliefs that have to do with God and things like that, uh, that happens in other places. So, um, in the same way, I mean, you know, uh, the whole of Denmark, for example, is member of the Church of Denmark. Uh, but that's mostly because, you know, on your tax forms, you have to take a special box to not contribute you know, one euro, one krona to uh, the church. That's it. Now, uh, many, many studies I've seen about uh, religiosity and its effects and stuff like that, uh, for reasons of convenience, uh, either take people's self-description uh, as I'm a believer, I'm atheist or whatever, as being a data point that is important and revealing, or uh, they take things like, you know, how many members, how many people are members of the church or, you know, how many people are baptized as being super important. And I think that's so misleading that, um, but the problem is that these kinds of data, like how many people are baptized, are incredibly easy to get. Okay. So uh, it's very tempting if you like, you know, multiple regressions to, to have two countries, more baptized, less baptized, more whatever, you know, higher income, less income, more inequality, and then run your regression and find your, your results. Uh, but many of the independent variables are not terribly clear. Mm -hmm. So that's sort of the same problem that, uh, and I'm going to talk about this because I've interviewed recently Lee Kronk, and he, mm -hmm. he, he studied how it is important to separate behavior from culture because what people say, I mean, many times it doesn't correspond at oh, all sure. to what they do. 
Yes, and I think it's not just in um, um, in in, uh, in in religious life. I mean, people know that. I mean, in economics, people talk about revealed preferences. You know, uh, even if you go around sort of saying that. Uh, uh, that uh, chocolate is terrible and salads are wonderful. At the end of the day, you know, what do you buy if you have a little bit extra money? Okay, so um, in the same way, I mean, it's it's it, it, it's true. People have this revealed preference that, for example, in lots of southern European countries, they think that the the church is a good provider of uh, funeral services. Mm-hmm. That's it. Um, does it mean that? All sorts of ideas they have. Uh, no, it just means that they have this preference for this service, uh, and that's all. So, um, in general, um, I, I, I think the sort of self-description is always misleading because of that. I mean, it's, it's the we find that in religion, we find that in economics, we find that in um, in gender relations. We were talking about that. That. Um, you know, it's a very sort of uh, well-known phenomenon that uh, men, just like women, uh, say that they want a certain kind of partner. And then when you look at what they actually choose, it's not at all what they said. So maybe they're sincere in their belief that it's like that, but their revealed preference is uh, underneath that is different. So, yes, I mean, it applies to religion as well. Okay, so let me just ask you one last question question about religion before we move on to the last question of all that comes from a patron of mine. So um, since uh, it is somewhat misleading to use the same term to refer to these yeah. disparate phenomena, uh, th- does that have any implications as to how we study religion from an evolutionary perspective and the several hypotheses that are yeah. out there on the table, like, for example, the byproduct hypothesis sure. and the adaptationist hypothesis and others. So um, I think these days, actually, the situation is, is uh, it's become a bit clearer in the sense that um, people who think that um, um, that we have religious uh, ideas or activities uh, because they're a byproduct of um, the way our minds work, that we find certain kinds of ideas more captivating than others. Um, those people are mostly focusing on the primitive religion kind of stuff, and, and they think that the rest is just a growth of that. Uh, the doctrinal religion or a sort of political phenomenon that happens once you have a state and once you have large-scale uh, institutions and so on and so forth. Uh, the people who think that uh, religion, uh, so to speak, that's again, it's a very uh, ambiguous term, um, uh, is adaptive, are not talking about biological adaptations, they're talking about cultural evolution. And what they're saying is that, uh, in their view, um, the development of religions with certain specific kinds of moral codes um, uh, are a factor in stabilizing large-scale societies uh, by by forcing some forms of cooperative behavior between people. I think that's not entirely um, correct. A very recent um, um, large-scale historical database kind of uh, study by uh, Peter Turchin and, and, and uh, Harvey Whitehouse uh, seem to suggest that if you look at ancient history and you try to document these things, uh, you find that the signals of uh, large-scale religion um, appear uh, two centuries after you have uh, a sort of centralized state authority. In societies, so it would seem to 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 suggest that um, uh, that in a way Marx <laughs> was was right to a certain degree that um, religion, in the sense of high doctrinal organization with uh, state support, is an instrument of the state more than something that. Uh, so the people who who, who defend this. Um, uh, adaptation kind of ideas say that the data is not that clear and so on and so forth. Uh, then it's an empirical question that will be you know discussed for many years, I'm sure. 
but um, but yes. Yeah, so uh, it seems to me that there's no real sort of confrontation between this adaptationist idea and the byproduct uh, byproduct idea because the adaptationist idea is mostly about recent developments, the last five thousand years. And it's about organized religion mostly. And the uh, people who talk about byproduct are talking about the whole of our uh, superstitious mind, so to speak. You know, we're sensitive to, to, to supernatural ideas and things like that. And it's been going on for hundreds of thousands of years, probably. Mm -hmm. Okay, so let's now move on to the last question that comes from my patron, Izar Weber from Lebanon. And she. She asked this question because she's going to study ev the evolutionary psychology of uh, conspiratorial thinking or conspiracy conspiracy theories in at Oakland University under Tom yeah. Shackleford. So, so she's very interested in these kinds of topics. And her, her question is basically she wants to know uh, if you can tell us about the key differences between religious believers and conspiracy theorists <laughs> and, and, re and relatedly, which contexts can trigger conspiratorial thinking? Well, no, the first question is, uh, I don't think it's, um, I mean, it's the same and it's different. I mean, the thing is that you can get lots of conspiratorial thinking. These things are orthogonal. You can uh, have religious beliefs that you've organized in a way that is very paranoid. Um, and you can have, uh, you know, conspiratorial thinking that has or doesn't have religious themes. I mean, these two are orthogonal. You can have any combination of these things. Uh, but what creates... Uh, so that's, that's an interesting thing. So why are we... Um, uh, why are we good or uh, at creating this idea that there is a conspiracy? And... Uh, why are those ideas so convincing? Uh, no, not convincing. Let's say we, but we transmit them. We acquire them. We transmit them to others. Now there are several uh, uh, important sort of things to remember about these things. First of all, uh, transmitting these things does not always mean that you have a high degree of certainty that they're true. Um, you know, most. Uh, urban legends, for example, are transmitted by people who are not totally committed to their being true. And conspiratorial thinking is the same. Um, I think it's in um, Hugo Mercier's new book that will come out in a few months, that he has uh, beautiful examples of people, for example, who say that the 9-11 attacks in New York uh, were done by the government, it's completely clear, it's completely obvious to them. Um, and the government, and it's, and they say, you see some people who studied this uh, have died mysteriously. They suddenly got sick or they had an accident or stuff like that. Okay, so you get this thing. Now, these same people, they organize a conference to talk about these conspiracies in Washington, in a hotel. It's all completely official so that the government can kill them if they want, you know, or abduct them or whatever. They don't seem to be scared at all. So it seems that their belief that if you, you know, that the government is trying to kill the the truth, you know, the 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 the, the whistleblowers, is not that clear. You know, they say that, but at the same time they act as if that wasn't the case. So, um, so in lots of conspiratorial thinking, you'll have that. Um, uh, in a classic case of rumor that was conspiratorial was. Um, a, a study of a French, uh, of a small town in French that was called the Rumor in Orléans, and that was uh, by uh, Edgar Morin, who was a famous sociologist. There was that rumor that in some um, clothes shops, uh, the, the women would go and try some uh, clothes in the, uh, uh, and then they would be abducted and sold for prostitution in some places and all that. Naturally, in that small place, uh, there was no reported the disappearance of any woman at the time in mysterious circumstances, so there was no fact. Those rumors um, concentrated on uh, Jewish Jewish stores or uh, uh, store owners. Okay, so it was clearly motivated by some sort of anti-Semitic kind of uh, content, uh, uh, prejudice. But the crucial thing that is so interesting about this is that people said that 
people spread those rumors, okay? And if you look at the amount of business that these stores made, it did not diminish over those <laughs> those time. In other words, the same women who said that there was that kind of thing would go to the stores and buy clothes. Mm -hmm. So uh, conspiratorial thinking has a very weird sort of thing in many uh, situations that it seems to be spread by people without leading to specific behavior. Mm -hmm. To take the opposite, you have situations where it does lead to uh, specific behaviors and then it's context of ethnic riot or things like that, where uh, people suddenly have this rumor that the other group uh, put poison in the wells so that our uh, water will be poisoned and then uh, there's an outburst of violence and things like that. These are cases where people take their conspiracies seriously. But what I find interesting is the amount of conspiratorial thinking that is transmitted by people who do not seem to behave as though it was true. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's very interesting. Uh, some people have um, I think there are some evolutionary psychologists who try to say that, well, um, conspiratorial thinking in a way is good in the sense that it's always good to err on the side of caution and to say, well, the others are against us. You know, it's better to think that and then the others can show that they are actually nice people rather than think they're nice and actually have them betray you. So that's that's good. Would uh, that have something to do with error management yeah, theory? Yeah, that's exactly error management theory. So the idea would be, yeah, that it's it's a sort of precautionary uh, 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 thing. But also, um, it might be the case, and that I think is pretty important, that um, when you say there is a conspiracy, um, there is a danger, uh, what you're telling people is, I'm giving important information to you. Uh, you know, I have information that's really important and that you should pay attention to. And I think there's a large uh, amount of um, that kind of thinking that can be explained in that way, that we, we want to be seen as the provider of important information. And because of that, uh, we'll latch on to any kind of information that makes it look like we, what we say really matters to other people, you know, uh, pay attention to what I'm saying. So that may be a factor. This being said, I've not, I've not studied these things, so I can't go any further there. Mm -hmm. Okay, so let's end with that. And before we go, uh, I will be leaving links, of course, to your work and your book in the description box of the interview. Would you like to make reference to some websites where people can go to get in touch with your work? Uh, well, I have a, a website that's called pascalboyer.net uh, uh, where there's all the articles and stuff and um, some bits of the recent book uh, are there and stuff like that so people can find all these things more than they want or more than they need that's for sure <laughs> <laughs> okay okay so uh, Pascal again it was really a pleasure to have you on the show and uh, I hope that somewhere in the future I will be able to have you on again because I really love your work <laughs> and I, I ended up leaving some some uh, topics out of the interview because we, we were already going over yeah. two hours. So. Uh, and and so th thank you a lot for coming on the show. No, thank you. It's great to, you know, to talk with someone who knows this stuff so well that we can, you know, uh, go fast and, you know, uh, and be efficient uh, in explanation. So thank you very much. Hi there, thank you for coming to my channel and for watching this interview until the end. As you might have noticed, I've been putting out regular interviews with academics and intellectuals from a variety of fields. So to keep the channel sustainable, I would like to ask you to please visit my Patreon page and to consider making a pledge there. Uh, otherwise, I also have a PayPal and Subscribestar. And if you like what I'm doing, please share it, leave a like and hit the subscription button. I would also like to give a huge thank you to my patrons, Karen Litzke, Anne Blanchett, Perel Galarsen, Lau Guerrero, Chantel Gelinas, Francis Ford, Hans Frederick Sunda, Brian Ian Rivera, Lucas Stafiniak, Sergio Condriano, Iane Henninen, Ricardo Vladimiro, and Dr. Jerry Muller, Herbert Gintis, and Ruth Gervois, and also my three producers, Isar Webb, Rosie, and Jim Frank. Thank you for all.